Tonight, breaking news this just in. Jussie Smollett found guilty. The disgraced actor convicted of lying to Chicago police about a racist and homophobic attack he orchestrated against himself. The jury deliberating for just nine hours before reaching a verdict. The nearly week-long trial filled with testimony from witnesses, including two brothers, who said Smollett paid them to beat him and tie a noose around his neck. Will the former Empire star face time behind bars? Also tonight, on the front lines of the growing crisis between Russia and Ukraine. Are Richard Engel in the freezing trenches with Ukrainian soldiers as they prepare for a potential Russian invasion? Ukrainian forces already exchanging gunfire with pro-Russian militants as the 100,000 troops sent by the Kremlin camp out along the border. President Biden warning Putin, but stopping short of saying he will send U.S. soldiers. Plus, the deadly plane crash near Houston, the tail suspended in tree branches, the aircraft going down near a highway. Authorities using four-wheelers to access the wreckage. The details still coming in. Drug debate. Jacob Soboroff inside one of New York City's safe injection sites where people can use illegal drugs like heroin and fentanyl under the supervision of a professional to prevent overdoses. The facility is the first of their kind in the U.S. City officials say it's working, but not everyone is convinced. Supply chain crunch. Toy makers racing to try and get their product products shipped in time for Christmas. Our Priscilla Thompson visited the warehouse filled with one of the season's hottest toys. LOL surprise. They have $200 million worth of orders ready to go. But will the dolls make it under your tree? And soccer slam. The global soccer star taking down a rowdy spectator after he rushed onto the field. Outraged tonight after the player was punished. Top story starts right now. Hey, good evening. I'm Tom Yamas. We begin top story tonight with breaking news. Jussie Smollett has been found guilty of lying to police about a racist and homophobic attack he staged. This video, Justin, coming into our newsroom right now, this is Jussie Smollett as he was entering that Chicago courtroom to later find out he was going to be guilty. Convicted on five out of six charges of felony disorderly conduct, the jury reaching a verdict in just nine hours. In January of 2019, the former Empire star made national headlines after he claimed he was attacked by two men in Chicago, saying they used racist and homophobic slurs, threw chemicals in his face, and wrapped a noose around his neck. Two brothers from Nigeria say Smollett orchestrated the entire thing, testifying this week that he paid them $3,500 to carry it out. Tonight's verdict comes after less than a week of testimony, which included more than a dozen witnesses. Let's get right to NBC News correspondent Megan Fitzgerald, who leads us off tonight with this breaking news from Chicago. Megan, good evening. Tom, good evening to you. This jury of six men and six women were tasked with combing through evidence presented over the seven-day trial. Uh, they had to determine if Jussie Smollett was a victim or if this was one big lie. Tonight, jurors finding former Empire star Jussie Smollett guilty on five out of six counts of lying to police. Jurors deliberating for two days, more than nine hours, reading the verdict to a packed courtroom filled with Smollett's family. Smollett told police that two masked men attacked him around 2 a.m. in January of 2019 in downtown Chicago, yelling racist and homophobic slurs and putting a noose around his neck. At first, the story spread as a hate crime against a gay black man, despite some skepticism over the details. If I had said it was a Muslim or a Mexican or someone black, I feel like the doubters would have supported me a lot much more, a lot more. And that says a lot about the place that we are in our country right now. But then the Chicago police announcing they believe Smollett faked the attack, calling it a, quote, bogus police report. Why would anyone, especially an African-American man, use the symbolism of a noose to make false accusations? The actor has always maintained his innocence. I have been truthful and consistent on every single level since day one. I would not be my mother's son if I was capable of one drop of what I have been accused of. Smollett says one brother was an acquaintance. The other was a friend who he had a sexual relationship with. All right, Megan Fitzgerald joins us now outside that courthouse there in Chicago. So, Megan, take our viewers inside to the courtroom. What was the mood like? What did Jesse Smollett do once he found out he was being convicted? 
So, Tom, we're talking about a packed courtroom filled with Smollett's family members, and this is what we saw consistent with the entire duration of this trial. Uh, when this verdict was read, uh, there was silence. Jesse Smollett standing up with his hands crossed, arms crossed, uh, very stoic, and that's consistent with what we saw on the faces of his family members as well. Uh, easy to surmise that this was a, a shocking verdict for his family. You know, there's been a lot of talk about what the sentencing could be. It could be community service. It could be time in prison. Do we know when he will find out that news? We know that there's a pre-sentencing hearing that is uh, for the end of January. Um, and we know that he faces up to three years in prison. But we have been consulting with legal experts who tell us it's not likely that he's going to get prison time. Uh, what's more likely is that he's going to serve probation. Uh, he'll do community service. And he likely will pay back um, restitution, Tom. Megan Fitzgerald leading us off on Top Story with that breaking news tonight. Megan, we thank you for that. For more legal analysis on this verdict, we want to bring in attorney Angela Senadella back on Top Story for us. So, Angela, we have like a, a trial that moved so fast, about five days from there, the verdict coming back so quickly to about nine hours. What does that tell us about this case? It tells us that zero of those 12 jurors believed anything Jussie said, because if they believed, if one of them believed it, then he would have been found not guilty. So it shows us that they believe the prosecution. They thought the evidence was so strongly in the prosecution's favor that beyond a reasonable doubt, they did not believe Jesse. Did the defense do anything right in this case? Could they have done anything right? I think the one thing the defense did is they kept their story straight, and that actually starts even before a trial. So Jesse, from the first moment that this all came about, he has kept his story straight. So there haven't been a lot of variations. He, in fact, also declined to pay back the civil lawsuit of the $130,000 settlement because he also said, look, I really didn't do this. So that, I believe, was the strongest part of their case. He may have stuck to a story. The jury clearly didn't believe that story. He also took the stand. In, that, in this case, was that a smart play or was that ultimately a mistake? I think that was their only choice here because the prosecution's evidence was so strong that it was a Hail Mary. They thought that Jesse, as a celebrity, would be able to connect with the audience, would be able to connect with the jury, and he did to some degree, but clearly not enough. You know, there's so much at play here because besides staging this hoax attack, there was also the issue of being a homophobic attack, a racist attack. How do you think that's going to affect him once the judge sentences his case? Do you think he'll just get community service or do you think he'll serve time in prison? So that will certainly affect the public opinion of Jesse, but it will not affect what the judge will do in this case. The judge will go by the law, not by whether or not he launched these attacks. It's, it's irrelevant in the point of the law. Okay. Angela Senadella for us tonight. Angela, we appreciate it. We want to turn now to Ukraine, the other big story we're following tonight, and the troops lining the trenches along the border with Russia. The Ukrainian forces already exchanging gunfire with pro-Russian militias, but fearing that this could be the place where tensions finally boil over. NBC News chief foreign correspondent Richard Engel has a story from the front lines. The front line between Ukraine and Russia is on high alert tonight. All leave canceled for the troops who will be spending the holidays in the trenches. Muddy today, often frozen solid. These positions are designed to stop or at least slow down a Russian advance. They could be tested with about 100,000 Russian troops, tanks and artillery massed along three sides of the Ukrainian border and by pro-Russian militias already inside Ukraine. This is the most dangerous flashpoint. Ukrainian troops occupy these trenches 24-7, and pro-Russian forces are just about 50 yards away. And according to the Ukrainian soldiers here, those Russian-backed troops fire on them almost every day. And it wouldn't take much for an escalation here to trigger a much wider war. When some um, side uh, start that attacking, it's uh, have casualties, no matter what they do. Lieutenant Ivan Skuratovsky showed us his frontline position, a rubber factory, devastated by an eight-year war with pro-Russian separatists that now has the potential to trigger the biggest conflict in Europe since World War II. Skuratovsky is under orders to exercise maximum restraint. We have no reasons to start the war. To avoid giving Russia a pretext to attack. Putin, uh, I think, not stop in the Ukraine. If uh, we don't stop it here, they go further. Nearby, Ukrainian troops showed us the separatist positions. 
They say they're backed, armed, and advised directly by Moscow. Ukrainians say Putin has all the troops he needs in place to invade. And now is just looking for a reason. All right. All right, Richard Engel joins us now from eastern Ukraine. And Richard, I saw your report on the Today Show this morning, and you were relaying the news that President Biden said outside the White House, which was the U.S. would not be sending troops in if there was a Russian invasion. I'm curious what the mood was and, and what was the reaction from the troops there in Ukraine you were talking to? So I asked troops about this uh, directly, and they weren't surprised. They didn't think that the U.S. would send Marines or large battalions of soldiers right to the border to confront uh, Russian troops and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them. Uh, what does happen here, and what they want to see more of, are advisors. There are military advisors that come periodically from the United States and other countries to help train the army. And what they're hoping is that if they have more advisors here working with them, one, it will help improve their, their skills and potentially bring more weapons with the advisors. But they're hoping that a small number of troops could act like a tripwire force so that if Russians did cross over the border, they wouldn't necessarily be met by the 101st Airborne Division, but they would run into some advisors which would signal to the Russians, this is a problem. We are now in combat with American troops carrying an American flag, and it could escalate the, the conflict further. But they don't expect at this stage the U.S. To, to reinforce the border, which is why they want to join NATO. They want to join NATO in order to have those kind of self-defense uh, reassurances. Richard, you spent time with those Ukrainian troops, and I know you spent a lot of time with armed forces all over the world. You've seen militaries well-equipped, well-trained. You've probably also seen ragtag bunches and also soldiers even scared to go into combat. What's the general mood of the Ukrainian forces staring down those 90,000 Russian troops? Well, I think they're realistic. They believe that they could bloody the Russians' nose, but they don't think they could defeat an all-on onslaught. And, and they were open about that. And there have been uh, commanding generals uh, in the Ukrainian army who've been saying the same thing, and soldiers, foot soldiers that we spoke to said the same thing. Uh, there would be casualties on both sides, no doubt. The area is full of trenches. It is full of landmines. Uh, the Ukrainian army does have heavy artillery. So if the Russians were to come over, uh, th there would be losses. But they would not be able to, to stop a, the, the full onslaught of the Russian military coming across its border after, it, after it's been reinforced. And one of the things they're most concerned about is that Russia is looking for a pretext, that it's not just that Russia is sitting back on the border and waiting to push a button or not. They, they worry that Russia is looking to either find an excuse or create an excuse, and specifically they're worried about the pro-Russian community in this country. And Vladimir Putin has been talking about the, that community a lot, saying that Ukrainians uh, are attacking that community, that Russia needs to come in and defend the pro-Russian community here. Richard Engel for us tonight. Richard, we thank you. Now to a major headline in the fight against COVID-19. The CDC has approved Pfizer's booster shot for fully vaccinated 16 and 17 year olds. This means 2.6 million American teenagers are eligible for their third dose just two weeks before the holidays. The teens will need to wait six months after their second shot for the booster. It comes one day after Pfizer said their booster shot was much more effective against the fast-spreading Omicron variant than the two-dose regimen. And we're following breaking news tonight out of Houston, where two people have died in a small plane crash. Officials say the single-engine Cessna went down in George Bush Park near the Katy Freeway. Deputies say they needed to use four-wheelers to access the wreckage due to the dense wooded area you see here. Both people on board were killed. The cause of this crash, though, is still under investigation. All right, now to a dramatic testimony in the trial of that former police officer who says she mistook her gun for her taser when she fatally shot Dante Wright. Wright's girlfriend tearfully recalling how she tried to save his life. Ron Allen has more. Put my hands over his chest and I just tried to hold it and I was just trying to scream his name. Dante Wright's girlfriend, the passenger in his car, describing the moments after former police officer Kim Potter, charged with manslaughter, had shot him in the chest. He's just like, just gasping. Just like, I, 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 
He just wasn't saying anything. Today, the jury's seeing more new police video as prosecutors focus on what happened in the minutes right after the shooting. Wright's car taking off, jumping a median, crashing into an oncoming vehicle. Put your hands up! Police testifying the first officers to arrive had no idea one of their own had shot Wright. One even telling the jury just after the crash he thought Wright was still alive. Did you see movement of the driver? Yes, sir. And that would be indicating that at that point in time, the driver was still alive, correct? Yes, sir. Prosecutors say the minutes after Potter shot right reveal more examples of how she failed in her duties that day. She didn't do anything to help him. She didn't call for assistance. She didn't render aid. She didn't communicate any information about what had happened to her fellow officers. The defense trying to convince the jury Wright's attempt to evade arrest for an outstanding warrant caused his death. I shot him! Oh my God! Telling the jury Potter's grief and regret are inconsolable. The jury seeing this video of Potter in the minutes after she shot Wright and while he lay dying not far away. Another powerful day in court. Ron Allen joins us now outside that courthouse in Minneapolis. Day two of testimony. And Ron, incredibly emotional. And we were talking earlier. You were telling me that there's so much new video in this case that we're now seeing for the first time. Prosecutors trying to build a case and tell a story. Not just video of the shooting that we've seen. It's video that shows what happened afterwards. Wright's car taking off, crashing, and then the response by the officers there. It takes, the prosecutors say, 10 minutes for the officers to approach the car at, at, once it comes to a stop. And one officer testifies that he thought that Wright was alive for some time. The, the prosecutors are trying to say that Kim Potter didn't do anything after the shooting, didn't render aid, didn't call for assistance, and didn't explain explained to her fellow officers what had just happened, which would have given them some clues as to how they should approach the situation. So the prosecutor is basically trying to give the jury a lot of reasons to convict her of manslaughter beyond just what we saw in the first videotape of the shooting. Ron Tom. Allen on yet another trial that a lot of the country is watching. Ron, thank you. Now to the latest on that deadly concert stampede. Travis Scott sitting down for an interview for the first time since his Astral World concert where 10 people were killed and hundreds more were injured. The rapper claiming he had no idea how serious the injuries were until he got off stage. NBC News national correspondent Miguel Almaguer reports. My intentions, you know, wasn't, you know, it wasn't to harm their family at all. In his you know? first interview since the tragedy at his concert, Travis Scott expressed remorse, but said he's not to blame. A Travis Scott show or, you know, an Astroworld show, you know, wasn't the bottom line factor of what happened here. In a lengthy conversation, Scott spoke with TV and radio host Charlemagne the God, saying he did everything he possibly could on the night of November 5th. <laughs> While headlining his own festival, 10 were killed during a crowd surge and hundreds were injured. But the show in Houston went on for more than 30 minutes as the rapper says he was unaware of the mayhem unfolding. Did you hear any of those screams? Nah, man. And you know, it's so crazy because I'm that, I'm that artist too. Like, you know, anytime you can hear something like that, you want to stop the show. And this week, with hundreds of lawsuits filed seeking billions in damage, Scott denied legal liability and asked for several claims to be dismissed. 21-year-old Axel Acosta died in the chaos. This is all part of a culture that Travis Scott created himself. And now he tries to pretend like he was surprised or he's a victim. He's no victim. I have a responsibility to, to figure out what happened here. I have a responsibility to figure out the solution. Tonight, Travis Scott breaking his silence, but not satisfying critics. Miguel Almaguer, NBC News. All right, we thank Miguel for that. Turning out of the unsolved murders of two teenage Indiana girls, a shift today with the public's focus turning towards one man who is already facing 30 felony counts related to separate charges nearly five years after the girls' deaths. Investigators are hoping for potential new openings in this case. NBC News correspondent Vaughn Hilliard has more. 
New developments tonight in Indiana, just days after Indiana State Police asked for the public's help in the investigation into the 2017 murders of 13-year-old Abigail Williams and 14-year-old Libby German, public documents related to a 2020 arrest and ongoing separate charges are now telling a chilling story involving this man who has told police he created social media accounts to lure underage girls around that time. I miss you. Call the tip line. That was Libby German's mom five years ago. Libby and her friend Abby went missing by this bridge in February 2017 and were found dead close by the next day. The best apparent evidence? This short video and audio recording of a man found on Libby's phone. <laughs> then, earlier this week, Indiana State Police asked for help from anyone who may have interacted with social media accounts named Anthony underscore shots. This young model is not a person of interest, but instead, police say, someone else used his images to talk to underage girls. But now, public records and a police affidavit revealed on Wednesday related to separate charges have turned focus to this man, Keegan Anthony Klein. That affidavit says Klein, quote, admitted to creating the Anthony underscore shots profile and speaking to underage girls all the way back in 2017. Just 11 days after the teen girls were found dead, the Indiana State Police, with the FBI and the local police department, went to the home of Klein and executed a search warrant. From the affidavit, Keegan admitted to speaking to approximately 15 girls that were underage, and Keegan stated he received approximately 100 sexual pictures from underage girls. Despite the on-site admissions by Keegan, though, the affidavit says he was transported back to his residence. The Indiana State Police still not connecting Klein to the teen murders, telling NBC News today they do not confirm or deny anyone who is or is not a suspect in any ongoing investigation. Libby's family echoing the state police's calls for assistance related to those social media accounts. Currently, we don't know um, how he's connected or even if he's connected. Does your family believe that he may be the man? I think we're just waiting for law enforcement to give us an answer for that. Despite police having this information, it was not until three and a half years later, in 2020, that authorities arrested Klein and a county prosecutor charged him on 30 felony counts, including child exploitation, child solicitation, possession of child pornography, synthetic identity deception, and obstruction of justice. Keegan Klein's court-appointed public defender, Andrew Akey, telling our affiliate 13 News, my client had nothing to do with the unexpected, untimely, and unfortunate passing of the girls in Delphi. And it gives us another sense of hope knowing that law enforcement's still out there working. I think it just shows us that, that stuff is happening, that movement's happening. All right, Vaughn Hillier joins us now live in studio. So, Vaughn, the families you were just telling me are staying measured here. There's no outrage. They're trusting the investigators and the process. So there's a lot of questions surrounding the timeline of the arrest on Klein, but you also have some important information about devices that were confiscated. Exactly. On February 25th, 2017, 11 days after the murders of Libby and Abby, when that search warrant was executed, the police confiscated six technology devices from him, but they did not receive from him his main phone until two days Days later, in that police affidavit, they explicitly say, quote, the user of the Apple iPhone 5C deleted multiple items off the phone before turning it into law enforcement. They went on to acknowledge that included his Snapchat and Instagram accounts from that phone. The question is, what were on those accounts? And is there any potential connection to Abby and Libby? At this time, we do not know. The FBI and local police department are also involved in this case, but they have referred all questions to the Indiana State Police, who are the lead agency on this. Yeah, that pile of documents you have there, those public documents, bringing up a lot of new questions. All right, Vaughn, we thank you for that. Now to new evidence in another cold case, the car of a man missing for 45 years, just found in an Alabama creek. And clues found inside the car may help authorities piece together what happened to him. NBC's Issa Gutierrez has that story. Tonight, an incredible discovery leads to new clues in a 45-year-old cold case. Police pulling out this car from inside a creek in Georgia after it had been there for nearly half a century. They say it belonged to Kyle Klinkscales, 
a student at Auburn University who disappeared on his way back to school from his hometown of LaGrange one night. It was 1976. For 45 years, we've looked for this young man and looked for this car, and we've drained lakes, and we've looked here and looked there and ran this theory down and that theory down, and it's always turned out nothing. Now, finally, something. After a call from someone who saw the vehicle submerged in the water, law enforcement arrived on scene and removed it right in front of them, their first clue. And there was one bone that we noticed sticking up out of the mud. But there was more inside the car, a wallet, ID, credit cards, all belonging to Kyle. Police also believe the bones in the car are human. For decades after his disappearance, Kyle's family never gave up looking for him. Any closure is better than none at all. He was his parents' only child, gone at 22 years old. Then you don't ever give up hope. This development, a bittersweet revelation, as both of them have since passed. His mother, Louise, dying earlier this year, just months shy of having witnessed this moment. I just hate that we can't share it with his mother. Now, these questions burning more than ever. Was he murdered and left there? Did he run off the road and wrecked there? That's some things we hope to discover, but it's been 45 years. How likely is it that investigators are going to be able to determine whether this was Kyle and what happened to him? I would say it's nearly 100% certain that they could at least um, identify who he is, whether it is Kyle. Um, it's a lot more difficult to say what happened to somebody when the condition of the remains is um, very poor. For years, investigators did look into Kyle's disappearance as a possible murder. In 2006, a man named Jimmy Jones claimed he was there, quote, the day Kyle was shot, according to court documents. But prosecutors concluded Jones had changed his story too many times and was, quote, totally worthless as a witness. Officials will determine whether to reopen the case once the newfound evidence is analyzed. Isa Gutierrez, NBC News. All right, we thank Isa for that. Still ahead tonight, the urgent search. The mother of four disappearing over two weeks ago, even missing Thanksgiving with her kids. How the family of Gabby Petito is now getting involved. Plus, Josh Duggar convicted. The former reality TV star found guilty of child pornography charges. The chilling testimony from a family friend who says he admitted to abusing children. And that Christmas tree fire, what the suspect reportedly said moments after setting the blaze. And the new tree standing in its place tonight. Stay with Top Story. We're just getting started. Back now in Top Story, reality show star Josh Duggar found guilty of downloading and possessing child pornography. Duggar, the oldest son in TLC's 19 kids and counting, could now face 20 years in prison. Here's NBC's Emily Aketa with more on these horrific charges. Tonight, reality TV star Josh Duggar staring down potentially decades behind bars. The 33-year-old found guilty on both charges of downloading and possessing child pornography. The verdict delivered after just one day of deliberations. It first and foremost shows that no person is above the law, regardless of their status in society, regardless of their wealth, regardless of their fame. Duggar's defense is promising to appeal after failing to convince jurors someone else uploaded the explicit images to his computers, including sexual abuse of toddlers, according to the Associated Press. Did you download child pornography onto your computer? One investigator called the images the worst of the worst he's ever had to examine. Duggar rose to fame while appearing on TLC's 19 Kids and Counting, spotlighting the large family's conservative Christian values. But the network pulled the show in 2015 after reports Josh Duggar, the oldest son, molested children as a teen. While Duggar didn't directly comment on the allegations, he did apologize in a statement then, reading in part, As a young teenager, I acted inexcusably, for which I'm extremely sorry and deeply regret. His parents revealing to Fox News four of the five victims were his sisters. Did you feel when Josh had been through all of this, he had gone to the the Christian-based treatment program, he had gone through counseling, he had gone to the police, and, and he emerged back into the home. Did you feel that he was a threat still? No, no. Josh was a changed person. And, you and, could, we, did, and, and we still had those safeguards in place. Duggar was investigated in 2006, but never charged, though the earlier allegations surfaced again in Duggar's federal trial this year. A family friend testifying Duggar admitted to molesting several girls in 2003. You don't forget something like that, she told the court. 
Duggar won't be sentenced for several months. Still, authorities celebrating the verdict as a milestone in their continued fight against child abuse. Every time child exploitation Im imagery is shared, downloaded, sent via email, saved, there is a victim. All right, Emily Aketa joins us now from Los Angeles. So the next step here is sentencing. What could the former reality TV star face? Because these are such serious charges. That's right, Tom. Duggar could face up to 20 years behind bars, plus a $250,000 fine for each count. His sentencing is expected to happen in several months, and it's worth mentioning, Tom, the closely watched federal case playing out as Josh's father, Jim Bob, pursues a state Senate seat. He's previously served in the Arkansas House of Representatives. Tom. Emily, thank you. When we come back, New York City launching the country's first safe injection sites. People can use illegal drugs like heroin in front of a professional to prevent overdoses. And are Jacob Soboroff getting rare access inside what drug users told him about these new facilities? Stay with us. All right, back now with Top Stories News Feed, and we begin with the urgent search for a missing mother of four in New York. 38-year-old Melissa Molinari was last seen leaving her Long Island home on November 21st, a friend reporting her missing a week later after she missed Thanksgiving with her husband and children. This week, a canine unit searching a water basin near her house. Gabby Batillo's father taking to Twitter, asking his more than 100,000 followers to help find Melissa. All right, now to the latest on the suspect charged with setting the Fox News news Christmas tree on fire. We brought you the story last night. The 49-year-old suspect released without bail after he was arraigned on a slew of charges, including arson. According to a criminal complaint, he allegedly told police he had been thinking about lighting the tree on fire all day. But tonight, a new tree was lit outside the Midtown Manhattan building after crews worked around the clock to rebuild it. The cast and crew of Rust are pushing back on claims the set was unsafe following that deadly shooting. A letter posted to Alec Baldwin's Instagram account read in part the descriptions of Rust as a chaotic, dangerous, and exploitative workplace are false and distract from what matters most, the memory of Helena Hutchins. The letter signed by two dozen cast members. Hutchins was fatally shot in October after Baldwin fired a prop gun that contained a live round. And Simone Biles has been named Time's Athlete of the Year. The magazine writing about the star gymnast's courage when she prioritized her mental health during the Tokyo Olympics and then took the stand to testify against Larry Nasser just weeks later. Biles, who's the most decorated gymnast of all time, pulled out of several Tokyo events, citing her mental well-being. All right, back here in New York City, we turn to the opioid crisis right now. More than 2,000 people in the city died of overdoses in 2020, the highest number on record. And last year, America surpassed 100,000 overdose deaths. Tonight, we give you an exclusive look at how the city is fighting back, opening the first two safe injection sites in the nation. Jacob Soboroff takes us inside. Since the beginning of last week, inside that facility across the street, the city of New York has allowed people to use illegal drugs like heroin and fentanyl under the supervision of a professional to stop them from dying of an overdose. Sam Rivera is the facility's executive director. Some people might call it crazy. I use a different C word. <laughs> to be courageous enough to do this, and, and we're seeing it. Already 17 lives reversed. Come on. 17 people have overdosed since you opened last week. Since we opened last week. And all of them have survived. All of them have survived. Hi, Kaylin. As Kaylin C. took us on a tour, the number of lives saved grew by one. So an overdose just happened just now. Yes. It's 100% reversible. New York City Health Commissioner Dave Choksi, a physician, says opening the facility is based on science. Have you talked to the commissioner of the NYPD about whether or not they'll be arresting people that go into these facilities to use drugs? Yes, we've had very productive conversations. We have a common mission, which is to save lives. And uh, NYPD and other local law enforcement um, will not enforce in overdose prevention centers. Has the Biden administration said whether or not they're going to try to shut these down? Um, they have given us no indication that uh, they will shut uh, our sites down. Um, Let me ask another way. Have they said that they support them being open? Uh, they have not given us explicit support, you know, for their being open, uh, but I'm hopeful that they will. 
uh, not just for New York City, but because this is so important for uh, other cities around the country. When we were inside, there were half a dozen clients using drugs. No more improperly discarded syringes on the streets, near our schools, in our subway stations. You won't, you'll find way less. On site, safely, <laughs> securely, without having to worry about overdosing. The voice behind the divider belonged to a man named Oz, who told us he's a Marine Corps veteran and was using heroin as we spoke. I've gotten more help here than I've gotten from, a, you know, from the VA. Have you been using for a long time? I've been addicted for the last uh, four years. And what's your hope in coming here? Mainly to be safe, you know? to know I'm not going to be robbed, I'm not going to be injured. Normally, I'd be down the block sitting on a stoop, injecting myself in the arm, not caring who's walking by or driving by. I never thought I'd see this day, you know. I know so many people who died, including some of my family, um, colleagues, a lot of colleagues. Uh, people who fought for this for many, many years. It's, it's, it's happy tears. <laughs> Not everyone's convinced. Some worry about sanctioning what is illegal activity. Others over what it could mean for the neighborhood. You know, there's a worry amongst people in the community. They don't want syringes in the street. They don't want people using drugs in the street. They don't want any paraphernalia in the street. Okay, we agree. And that's how you're going to stop it. That's how we stop it. All right, Jacob joins us now in studio. Jacob, I'm really happy you did this story because all you have to do is walk through New York City and you'll notice there is a massive drug problem, unlike anything I've ever seen in the Everywhere. 20 or so years I've lived here. But my question is this, what happens after they get high? Do they stay in that center? Because a heroin high can be anywhere from four to six hours. That's exactly the idea, Tom, so that people can be supervised while they're using these illegal drugs in case of an overdose. Because as you know, fentanyl is so deadly, multiple stronger than morphine, uh, even stronger uh, than heroin. And so this clinic, they want to be able to reverse an overdose immediately after it happens so that if people do want to get into treatment, if they do want to get into rehabilitation, even use the wellness center where they have things like massage and yoga upstairs. This is not about a luxury. It's about what they say is meeting people where they're at in order to give them options and really literally prevent them from dying. So some people may be watching this outrage that people are, they may say, encouraged to do drugs. But what happens after? Is there anything being done to get them off the drugs? I think that that's, it's such an important point. And actually, the clinic themselves say we understand why people feel that way and why they say that. The New York City Health Department will point to the success in these programs of not only getting needles off the street, but reducing crime in the area, stopping people from dying so that they can get them into programs to stop using drugs. But their, their main goal is not to get them to stop using drugs today. It's to meet people where they're at in life to give them the option to stop using if if that's what they want to do because sort of the tagline amongst activists in this community is you cannot help a dead person. You know, just to be clear, because this is sort of the perfect story for misinformation to get out. This clinic is not giving drugs to these people. No, absolutely not. What they are doing is saying, if you come in here with drugs that you purchase, and let's be real, these are illegal drugs. Number one, the New York City Police Department is not going to arrest you in there, but we'll also have clean needles, safe needles, safe pipes, things like that. Paraphernalia, basically, that you cannot bring outside to use on the streets so that, you know, kids can see this, things like that. You're going to do this within the four walls of this facility. Uh, even though it is illegal, we're going to try to keep you alive, and then we'll go from there. Jacob Soberoff for us tonight. Jacob, we appreciate it. Now to Top Stories Global Watch, we begin with the deadly fire at the headquarters of a political party in Tunisia. At least one person dead and nearly 20 injured after the fire ripped through the building in Tunis. The country's former prime minister injured after he jumped out of a window. The cause of the fire is under investigation, but authorities are reportedly looking into claims someone lit themselves on fire inside. New Zealand, Get this, moving to ban smoking for future generations. Under the law expected to pass next year, people ages 14 and older would never be able to purchase cigarettes. The legal smoking age will keep rising every year, so smoking will eventually be phased out. The level of nicotine in cigarettes will also be reduced. And the soccer star body checking a fan during a match in London. Check this out. The fan running onto the field, or maybe just a rowdy spectator, the championship league game gets a selfie when Chelsea forward Samantha Kerr knocked him down. Kerr was then given a yellow card, which was met with anger by fans who said security and the ref are to blame for the man even making it. 
near the players. All right, now let's turn to the Americas, where we take a look at the stories coming out of the U.S. and Latin America. Tonight, the flow of migrants seeking asylum across the U.S.-Mexico border continues. Thousands arriving in Yuma, Arizona, after misinformation online pushed many to make their journey. Their arrival coinciding with the announcement that the U.S. will resume the Remain in Mexico policy. NBC's Guad Venegas has more. They arrived by the dozens, some dragging the few belongings they could bring with them, others carrying their children, many of them coming all the way from South America, Venezuela, Cuba, and Colombia, rushing to cross this open gap along the Yuma-Arizona border. This Peruvian mom forced to lie to her three-year-old son for motivation. No, le hemos dicho para poder caminar, le hemos dicho que estamos yendo a la playa como a él le gusta. Most came with one goal in mind, to seek asylum in the United States, but now they must wait. More than 4,000 migrants have crossed the border into Arizona since Friday, thousands rushing to cross the border after misinformation began spreading that the U.S. was once again processing asylum claims. The rumors coinciding with the announcement that the Remain in Mexico policy would go into effect on Monday. But migrants quickly realized that making a claim would be a challenge. Families forced to set up camps along the border wall, waiting for Border Patrol officials to pick them up and process their claims. Some have been waiting for days, forced to endure the unforgiving desert climate, scorching days and freezing nights that make the wait nearly unbearable. In an effort to help local law enforcement, the governor of Arizona, Doug Ducey, has deployed the National Guard to the border. The Republican governor paying a visit on Tuesday where you can see the migrants continuing to cross as he spoke. We've been seeing thousands of migrants every day for several days. Calling the recent surge a humanitarian crisis, but pointing the finger to the current administration. The Biden border crisis is out of control and it's getting worse by the day. Meanwhile, the secretary of the Department of Homeland Security urging migrants to remain vigilant and not make the risky journey. Individuals should not put their lives in the hands of smuggling organizations because they are not safe. The border is not open and uh, there are alternative paths to seek humanitarian relief that uh, exist now. The Remain in Mexico policy once again posing a challenge to President Biden, who spoke out against it during his presidential campaign. This is the first president in the history of the United States of America that's anybody seeking asylum has to do it in another country. That's never happened before in America. President Biden forced to bring back the Trump-era rule after losing a battle in federal appeals court and the Supreme Court. Tonight, the flow of migrants continues along. As the doors to the American dream keep closing in. Guad Venegas, NBC News. We thank Guad for that report from the border. Coming up, holiday crunch time. The maker of LOL Surprise, one of this year's hottest toys, now struggling to ship them out. Priscilla Thompson takes top story inside their warehouse to find out, will the products get shipped out in time for Christmas? If you have kids, you're going to love this story. Stay with us. Back now on Top Story, we turn now to Money Talks, what consumers and investors need to know from the business world and beyond. We visited the toy company trying to untangle supply chain, snarled in time for the holidays, and time is running out with only weeks until Christmas. NBC's Priscilla Thompson met the company CEO at the starting line. It's the race to deliver the merchandise in time for Christmas. On your mark, get set. Go. For Isaac Larian, the race toward this Christmas morning is the biggest challenge he's faced in his 43 years as founder and CEO of MGA Entertainment. We are trying to ship as much as we can, but right now it's pretty much sold out everywhere. Larian is the toy maker behind Little Tykes, Bratz, and one of the hottest toy lines this holiday season. It's the house of surprises. And this is what LOL Surprise. LOL Surprise. 65% of toys are sold during the last eight weeks of the year. That we have still $200 million worth of orders that we have to ship, and they're not gonna make it in the stores on time for Christmas. 
If Larry and his Santa, John Baker runs his workshop or her warehouse in charge of getting MGA toys onto store shelves. Three weeks out from Christmas, should the warehouses be this packed? Absolutely not. In a normal year, he says 75% of what you see here would have shipped out by September. Instead, this warehouse the size of 10 football fields is jammed with a backlog of orders because... We begin top story tonight with the supply chain emergency. The supply chain is slowly revving up again, but as all of the inventory finally starts to arrive, the company has had to add seven more warehouses to store it all. So the problem really is there's just not enough space to be going through the inventory, packing those shipments and getting you can't get them out quick enough. That's correct. Things have gotten so backed up here that the pallets of toys are now spilling out of the warehouse and into the parking lot. That's on top of the 600 shipping containers that haven't even been unloaded because there's simply not enough space inside. And you can double that because there's 600 more still stuck on the water. We've sold nearly all of the contents of those 600 containers to our customers and we made commitments that would be on their store shelves right now, not sitting in the port of LA. Labels now print out 24 hours a day as orders get packed and sent out the door. Still, it may not be enough. What happens if all those toys are still in the warehouse in January? It's not just toys. It's going to be shoes, apparels, all consumer goods. There is going to be so much merchandise out there. Then you have to lay off people. So it has a ripple effect, frankly, through the economy that I don't think people understand yet. For now, Larian and his team are working round the clock to cross the finish line and deliver smiles on Christmas morning. Priscilla Thompson, NBC News, Chatsworth, California. I think Priscilla might leave the news business for the toy business. All right, when we come back, honoring Bob Dole, the political giant, line in state at the Capitol Rotunda, the bipartisan show of support for the former senator and the emotional moment his wife went up to the casket. Stay with us. Finally tonight here on Top Story, honoring a giant of history. Right now, a live look from the Capitol Rotunda where former Republican Senator and presidential candidate Bob Dole is lying in state. Political leaders from both sides of the aisle, including President Biden, coming together to honor the war hero today and the emotional moment that brought the late senator's wife to tears. For a moment today, the shouting and fighting on Capitol Hill paused as Congress and the country witnessed this. Elizabeth Dole reaching out and touching the casket holding her husband, Bob Dole. The couple married for 46 years. Dole, a war hero and former Senate Republican leader, also the party's 1996 presidential nominee. Line in state today in the Capitol Rotunda. Bob Dole loved this Capitol. In a sentence, Bob belongs here. President Biden remembering his colleague and friend. We disagreed on a number of things, but not on any of the fundamental things. We still found a way to work together. We genuinely, we genuinely respected one another as colleagues and as fellow Americans. It was real. It wasn't fake. He did have great wit. They once asked him why in God's name did he vote to continue to fund Amtrak. He said because if he didn't, Biden would stay overnight and cause more trouble. I commuted every day. <laughs> it's a true story. Dole himself memorably putting that humor on display as he was being awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom, pretending to give an inauguration address just months after losing his bid for the presidency a third time. I, Robert J. Dole, <laughs> do solemnly swear. <laughs> Oop. Sorry, wrong speech. <laughs> Dole fought in World War II, risking his life to recover the body of a fellow soldier, suffering lifelong paralysis in his right arm as a result of that gesture. Dole spent his time on Capitol Hill as a Kansas senator, focusing on food insecurity and rural issues, most notably creating the food stamp program and advocating strongly for the Americans with Disabilities Act. He'd taken the fight to the Nazis and he'd nearly paid for it 
with his life. Bob was the last of the greatest generation to run for president. But he was never stuck in the past. His roots ran deep, but he was always looking to new horizons. In one of his final public appearances, Dole saluting the casket of former President George H.W. Bush. Dole now being honored as one of the country's greatest patriots, a man who even in death could bring Republicans and Democrats together. I don't know what my legacy will be that, that I live to be 200 or at least 100 and that I never forgot where I was from. Bob Dole was 98. Thanks for watching. Good night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.